All right, we're kicking off with uh, our 63.1 event. That is uh, the second one in a week. We are getting tired as a team of Spec and Tech, and this is the final one uh, with the collaboration of the ICT days. Uh, Julia, just uh, very quickly, who we are, who's here for the first time at Spec and Tech? Però. Oh. Madonna. Sixty. <laughs> okay, so for those of us who answered the poll question, uh, briefly we are a station and we started the unit in 2016 trying to really relax our audience with really open sector passionate and interested not only students but also professionals and members. We feel that those uh, MCPs and the staff that know the MCPs um, they actually have passed but then they still have to use it. And then uh, uh, on the first very event of 2024 is uh, in collaboration with the Lab. And then uh, last week... Uh, oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Hold on. Who was here last week? Can you raise your hands? Okay. <laughs> there was a hell of event and also quite different from what we are used to, if you can recall. Like, uh, it was uh, um, Stallman and uh, Spec and Tech and ICT, okay? He was the one dictating rules and you see like uh, writing notes, uh, writing questions on paper and uh, uh, also no Mac, no uh, software, nothing allowed. Uh, it was yeah, only free software, of course. Uh, so. Uh, for the people that said, we don't like you doing auction and uh, Aste, um, uh, and selling uh, uh, adorable GNU at the event, uh, it wasn't us deciding, okay? We were free riding. Tech, uh, just just come. And so today we will talk about uh, 6G and welcome at this uh, event. A warm round of applause. Uh, I'd like to start by inviting on stage uh, Professor Paolo Casari from the University of Trento, from Dizzy. Thank you. So this is just uh, to thank uh, all of you for uh, contributing to the success uh, of this, the ICT Days, which has been uh, the main event of our department this year as well, and that uh, has been also collaborating with Spec and Tech uh, to prepare and uh, fund and uh, co-fund and co-organize this event. So the, I just would like to remind you that uh, the ICT Days are not over. This is uh, the culminating event of our second day. Our third day will be tomorrow with uh, two important events. One uh, for uh, AI passionates uh, is our workshop on AI and health, featuring uh, experts from uh, AI as well as uh, people uh, from the operating room of uh, uh, Trento's uh, uh, health uh, organization. And then uh, we also have uh, our closing event uh, with alumni from the uh, department graduating with us and uh, giving us their experience. For students, this is also a way to get uh, exposed uh, to abroad studying opportunities. So it is a great event and I, told, I totally recommend that you participate. So thank you again. Without further ado, I will uh, let you continue with this and uh, enjoy the event. Thank you, Paolo. All right. As you know, Spec and Tech started two years ago to organize events uh, of uh, tech dissemination for people that are not developers or passionate of tech, but uh, would like to understand a bit better how to manage their smartphones or their computers. Uh, we called these events uh, 
a smartphone or pane botoni, which uh, is quite funny uh, if you're a Trentino person. And the uh, next event is actually this Saturday. So if you have uh, grandmothers, uh, aunts, uh, uh, grandfathers, uh, people that you would like to help, uh, but you're like, oh God, he's asking me again this stuff. Yeah, send it to us and we take care of them. It's gonna be in uh, uh, Gardolo this Saturday uh, morning. So just tell us and we organize this, event. we uh, take care of them. Another spoiler, next event uh, of Spec and Tech back in uh, um, the um, Impact, Impact Hub. Hub. Yeah, I was forgetting that place, yeah. Yeah, Which our headquarters. Yeah. Uh, at Impact Hub Trentino is gonna be on the 20th of May and we are talking about uh, AI ethics. Two weeks later, we're gonna be here next door in Soy, in the School of Innovation, and we organize an event uh, about, uh, and it's gonna be a festival. It's gonna be a festival about open. Open what, you, you will ask? We will let you know more on our social media. So just follow us there. You can find all the information on our website with all the possibility to contribute. Uh, if you're a company, if you'd like to sponsor, you know, we're gonna open the registration to the retreat uh, real soon, the retreat V5. Uh, and uh, it's also a good opportunity to meet companies and to meet speakers. Um, on our website, you can find more or less everything. Yeah, also content from previous uh, events. So today is your first time. You can uh, go back and uh, rewatch all, uh, all the previous video, find slides and all the materials. For more serious stuff, if you're also looking for a, a job or new opportunities, in the job uh, section of our website, you can find uh, people who are hiring, like uh, OpenMove, who sponsored our last event. Yeah, exactly. Tomorrow, uh, they're hoping they have in their open day at OpenMove, uh, they're offering free beers, uh, aperitivo, and food for everyone. So if you would like to upgrade your career, it's a good opportunity. They were the ones sponsoring the food uh, of last event, uh, so beer, spec, etc., and uh, focaccia and taralli. So it's good to give back at some point to get more food. So just uh, go and visit them. For Mm, be have be able to get uh, the seats for the next 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 uh, event stay tuned on telegram telegram is the first channel on which we uh, send the link to reserve your spot but also you can find us on our social media and uh, if you take pictures tonight uh, please share them on instagram and tag us so help out also is uh, help us to improve tonight. I'm not, I'm not able to speak. And tomorrow, tomorrow morning, you will receive this feedback form, so you can leave your honest uh, and sincere opinion uh, about uh, this evening. We are not gonna sell GNU, and we are gonna get the money for us. Just just to be be, be sure, okay? That's it. Questions for tonight? Not on paper, on Slido slide.do slash spec and tech or you can just uh, head to the website it's going to be here visible all night long so don't worry we're going to ask uh, our main speaker all the questions uh, at the end of his talk our main speaker is Mohamed Slim Alouini and we have Claudio Sacchi to introduce him uh, a warm applause to our professor <laughs> Good evening. I'm very proud to introduce you my friend, Mohamed Slim Alouini. I still remember when I met him for the first time. It was a, in a cold and rainy Helsinki in early June 2001 during the ICC conference, the IEEE International Conference of Communications. We met, I remember that we met during the presenter breakfast uh, at 7 a.m. o'clock, um, and I remember it arrived on foot at, at, at the convention center after breaking my umbrella in a storm. <laughs> After, uh, after this uh, a bit trouble meeting that was uh, even uh, appreciated and fruitful, uh, I appreciated a lot uh, Slim's work about wireless and mobile networks, uh, often citing his uh, groundbreaking papers in my modest literature contributions. 
Then uh, I met him again in Sochi, in Russia, in 2019, uh, during the IEEE Black Sea Com conference. And during that conference, I invited Slim to join uh, my IEEE technical panel that I'm chairing, uh, uh, Glue Technologies for Space Systems. This is an important point because sometimes uh, people working uh, in uh, terrestrial communications are trying to ignore uh, space and satellite communications. This is not true for, uh, this is not the case of Slim, uh, who intends to promote a global view of communications where Earth and space integrates in a framework of global coverage and digital divide reduction. These are key objectives of 6G and the future deployment beyond the 6G. Yes, there is a future after 6G. Mobile communications perspective always evolves and do not stop. Paolo Casari, organizer of the ICT days, and myself think that, that Slim is the right person to show you what 6G will uh, really represent for the future of personal and mobile networking, not only for his uh, CV and his publication list uh, would take uh, maybe one hour to be summed up, uh, just mainly for his outstanding uh, divulgation capability that you will for sure appreciate during this event. Uh, so, Slim, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like first to, of course, um, uh, thank the um, organizer of SPECTEC for uh, inviting me, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, some of our views and some of our work in the area of 6G. I would like to thank uh, Paolo uh, and Claudio for this uh, very nice introduction and for reminding me my uh, my early days when I uh, start working um, in wireless communication uh, and uh, our first meeting in ICC Helsinki. So uh, the talk is about uh, 6G, uh, but really I'll be focusing on one narrow aspect of 6G, uh, at least uh, the, the, the aspect that uh, uh, I like to work on and a few of us uh, in the community are in, in, in that particular aspect of 6G. And uh, I think Claudio in his introduction alluded to that. And hopefully as we progress in this talk, we will kind of uh, dig deep into this particular aspect in 6G that you will discover. So uh, as you know, uh, maybe most of you know now about 5G. 5G start being deployed in the late 2019, early 2020. Uh, but uh, 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 as you may know, it's a 10-year cycle. So since then, since 2019, 2020, those of us active in wireless communication, we started working on what might be, what should 6G be uh, and beyond 5G uh, be. Uh, why? Because uh, the plan is to start deploying this kind of network by the end of this uh, uh, 2020 era, which is 2029, 2030, 6G is going to be deployed. And often uh, when uh, you go to the ICC conferences, what you will see is uh, mostly researchers trying to push the envelope. Uh, by that, I mean, okay, we are doing now the gigabit per second. How do you get to the terabit per second? We are doing few milliseconds of end-to-end uh, -end delay. How can we go to the fraction of millisecond delay? We are able to connect, uh, let's say, one device uh, uh, per meter square. How can we connect 10 devices per meter square? That's the Olympic records that uh, many of us in wireless communication are after, and most of the research is kind of focusing on that. But there is another important aspect of beyond 5G and 6G where we should pay attention. So the first aspect, although it will not be uh, the main focus of today's talk, is energy efficiency. Clearly, 5G 
you know, did some progress on speed, on coverage, but uh, it came at the cost of being really not very energy efficient. And there are some serious concerns about CO2 footprint, about the energy bill of a mobile network operator. So there are also some great effort in our Beyond 5G and 6G, uh, basically, research to make the future network more energy efficient. Okay? Another uh, interesting uh, uh, research aspect uh, this is done actually in collaboration with Luca Sierra Vargilio from the uh, University of Rome uh, Tor Vegata. So we have a joint project together and he's, I, I would say, one of the best uh, experts in the world on this topic. It's about EMF radiation exposure. Uh, this topic is a recurrent topic. Every time a new generation of wireless communication is deployed, often in the news you will see these kind of uh, reports on uh, is 5g harmful is it going to deal to uh, lead to some disease it's an important debate uh, uh, we, we have written a few papers on this uh, our perspective is that we are still operating in a safe regime but obviously we have to be careful as we move to high frequencies probably some extra research has to be done to characterize maybe beyond thermal effect. Usually when you look at the health effect uh, of radiation, you, you focus on the so-called thermal effect, the heating effect, but there are maybe some other effects that we need to study, characterize, and this is done mostly by biomedical biologists who can understand the interaction with waves with the body. So that aspect has to continue. We need to do more research on this topic, but as telecom engineer, we need to develop, and that's what we have been doing in this project, uh, what we call EMF, radiation aware networking. How can we design network that can provide pretty much the same quality of service, the same kind of delays, the same kind of data rates, but with much lower EMF exposure? And there are ways of doing that. Often these two links, which means, uh, or these two kind of uh, topics, EMF, radiation, energy efficiency, go together. Often if you are energy efficient, you end up you know, radiating less and, and, and same thing. So these are two good objectives to look at. So these were kind of two aspects that I sometimes I would say they are not very emphasized uh, when you look at this Olympic record type of research, uh, but this is not the main topic of today's talk. The main topic of today's talk is the energy, the global connectivity divide. What we tend to forget is that we still have about 3 billion people who are unconnected or underconnected worldwide. We are talking about people, you know, in developing countries, but even in developed countries like the US, you have a strong fraction. I think in the US is 15% of people, often in rural area, who are not well connected or not connected at all. The reasons are many. I will give you one simple reason that will lead to what I would like to talk about today is what we call the backhaul problem. It is expensive to basically bring connectivity to remote areas because often there is no business case. In other words, it, makes, it takes a lot of money to dig uh, over tens of hands of uh, hands or thousands of kilometers and put fiber optic to kind of uh, reach this remote area, uh, this rural area, often low income areas. There is no return on investment. So, you know, the mobile network operator, understandably, let's say, do not invest much into these areas. They tend to invest more into highly dense populated area where they can get the return on investment. And, and there are many other reasons, but uh, this is one among uh, other reasons that lead to this, you know, bad number. Three billion people is one third of world population that is still behind. And uh, when I started this, actually, it was before COVID. And actually, when COVID hit, actually, really, COVID showed that the digital divide or coin divide is, in a way, one of the modern phase of inequality between the people who have connectivity and those who don't have, those who can keep working, keep, kind of keep uh, having an income, and people who lost their job, lost their ability to contribute to the kind of economy of a country because, in part, they are not connected or their job cannot be uh, put in a connected format. So, uh, all of this may be linked to uh, maybe what some of you know uh, as uh, the so-called uh, United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. These are very noble goals that have been developed uh, uh, about 10 years ago. 
the target is 2030. I'm not sure if we'll be able to achieve all this noble and great goal uh, in 2030 by providing quality education for everyone, reduce inequality between people and so on. If you read every single goal, it's a beautiful goal uh, that obviously we would like all to achieve uh, globally or worldwide. But, and the, the, the 2030 target is, is a little bit of an optimistic target. But in a way, when we started in the 2019, 2020, working on this topic, we felt that there is a good, uh, I would say, uh, uh, timing. Uh, because 6G is supposed to start being deployed in 2030. These goals are supposed to be achieved for 2030. So together, if 6G is basically in part driven by this United Nations SDGs, would have achieved quite a bit. What do I mean? I mean that when you look at the history of mobile communication, again, this 10-year cycle, we started about 50 years ago, most of, or if not all, of the generation have been driven, and there is nothing wrong with that, you want to have business, they were driven by financial and profit kind of, uh, basically, uh, perspective. We would like 6G to be sustainable and viable, of course, to, to, to keep uh, making sense from a business perspective, but we want 6G to also try to be driven, as I mentioned earlier, at least in part, by this United Nations, uh, basically, SDGs. What does it mean? We want to address some of the shortcomings I talked about earlier. We want to be much more energy efficient, reduce our CO2 footprint, make sure that basically also we don't radiate more than needed. We want to kind of reduce EMF radiation in order to protect the environment and human health. Digital inclusion, that should be also a big mandate of beyond 6G and 6G. We need to connect more people in an affordable fashion, in a global fashion. And this is the whole objective of my talk today, to talk or touch up on some of the technologies that will allow us, hopefully, to achieve some of, some of the digital inclusion objective. Of course, although this is not my area of specialty, but I feel that this is a very important topic, uh, as we rely more and more, all of us, in our daily life on our smartphone, we need to make sure that these networks are secure and preserve our privacy. And again, because really we rely on them for every single thing in our life now, we cannot afford uh, to have outages of network. The same way we cannot tolerate uh, blackouts. I mean, like when the power grid goes down, it's a big event, right? Everyone talks about it. Same thing now when the network is down, you know, many of our day-to-day -day activities cannot happen, which means we need to make sure that these networks are resilient, robust, dependable. So uh, let me now go back and kind of refocus on this main theme of uh, today's uh, uh, perspective on 6G, which is uh, bridging the connect divide. And I would like to re-emphasize that doing so allow us to kind of uh, basically, uh, let's say, break this vicious cycle of digital divide where we have undeveloped area. And because of that, no one invests there, not even ICT. And then basically because of that, you know, there is no development, there is no prosperity, and you end up again not having any digital infrastructure. So if you kind of try to break the cycle, you can bring good, sometimes remote education, you can bring health services, again, sometimes often in a remote fashion. And actually one very important aspect that has been demonstrated many times over the last decade in Africa, and it has a kind of a nickname, if you will, or a short way of describing it, is when you connect the unconnected, you bank the unbanked. You give opportunity for people in rural areas to do financial transactions. Many people don't have bank accounts. They just rely on cash uh, to do transactions or middlemen. The fact that you give them a phone allow them to start, like in Kenya, there is a very success, a nice success story, uh, I forgot the, uh, the name of the, the company, that basically because of mobile connectivity, all transactions are done in many parts of rural Kenya through basically mobile transactions. So uh, this, uh, uh, you, basically what I'm trying to say, connectivity can bring prosperity to this remote region and can lift basically uh, uh, the local economies uh, in these uh, uh, rural and remote areas. Another very important aspect that we highlighted in this paper with my collaborator Elias Yaqub a few years ago is that when we think about connected and connected, again, we tend to think about rural areas, uh, you know, developing countries and so on. But uh, there is another interesting perspective to this is that uh, actually once you start having 
many, many more connected environments, which means uh, you are not only connecting downtowns, but you are connecting suburb areas, rural areas. You may first uh, kind of uh, stop some of the migration from these rural areas to urban area because you are creating opportunities in rural area and uh, many of the local population may not be uh, kind of incentivized anymore to move to urban area. But more importantly, you can help with another critical uh, uh, basically problem that we are facing globally, which is the global urbanization problem. There is an exponential growth of mega cities worldwide. And basically the fact that you are going to connect many of the surrounding environment may incentivize people to move back from urban environment to suburban or even rural areas because many of the jobs can lend themselves to remote jobs or not, you don't have to show up in your office every day. And maybe many people may enjoy living in a nice, uh, less polluted, less congested uh, uh, rural or suburban environment without having every day to deal with the traffic of an urban environment. So, what we are trying to say here, you move from, <clears throat> in a way, the narrow concept of a smart city to the broader concept of smarter villages, smart uh, hamlet, smart living in general, where basically connectivity can make all this look in a very seamless and very transparent for uh, the end user, regardless where they are. Another extra motivation behind some of the work we are doing uh, relate to the resilience is basically the fact that we tend to forget, those of us who are very well connected, that actually this connectivity can be lost overnight. A volcano or er eruption, an earthquake, a man-made uh, uh, terrorist attack can make you lose your network overnight and you may end up having thousands if not uh, tens of thousands people unconnected overnight. So whatever technology you develop to connect the unconnected, because they are unconnected, because they are living in remote areas, can be in a way reused in the context of what we call post-disaster or emergency communication, where the ground infrastructure is destroyed, the base station, and this happened, as you may remember, last year in Turkey, you know, the whole, many of the base station reports were down, and actually thanks to, and I'll talk about that, drones, you can bring connectivity, and drones or aerial solution are one of the solutions we are advocating for to bring connectivity to these remote areas. You have an event, very special event, a concert, the final of a soccer match, where you need extra capacity. You can bring this extra capacity on demand and in a, in a way connect people that would have been unconnected because there is extra capacity. You are sending, let's say, um, uh, scientists in the middle of nowhere, in the Amazon, in Antarctica, and you would like to video stream uh, their data in real time. That's also a connect uh, the unconnected type of problem. Of course, uh, uh, there is always a dual use to all these problems, so military can always benefit from this research, if not lead in this research, because they often tend to operate in not connected environments. So that's an example of work actually done one of my, one of my former PhD students, Morilio Matrashia, uh, so with uh, my former postdoc, Dr. Mustafa Kishk. So we looked at uh, how drones can help uh, basically in post-disaster communication setup. And uh, I would not go into very much detail. What I would like to highlight here, uh, the formulation of the problem is, you have a disaster in red. This disaster is going to kill these base stations. So there is no coverage anymore in this area. How are we to bring coverage? We assume we're going to send a swarm of drones. The whole idea behind this paper was actually to show that what is important when you send drones is to have a knowledge of how big is this disaster. Why is this important? This is going to dictate what kind of drone solution you'll use. I'm using this drone because it's going to introduce what I would like to talk about down the road. Basically, what we are showing here, a disaster radius of basically few tens, like basically one kilometer to 10 kilometer. And then when you are in this relatively small ranges, you can send uh, three, ten, like that's the density of drones, it's a stochastic geometry based analysis of drones, and you have a peak of coverage here, that's a coverage probability, depending on the size of your disaster and the number of drones. But the main message we are trying to convey, if, you are, if your range of disaster, a flood or a volcano in the order of uh, tens of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers, it does not make much sense anymore to send low altitude drones. What you need to go for is high-altitude drones. 
because when you send a lot of small drones again if they are you know using using the same resource the same bandwidth they will start interfering and basically they are hard to to control and to manage so it's better to go high in altitude and that's I would, I would like to talk about high alpha platform station. We'll talk more about them as you progress. And with one or two of these so-called HAPs, you can basically cover the whole disaster area. Now, one last slide before we move a little bit more technical. This slide is another final motivation behind its, uh, the importance of doing connecting the unconnected type of research. I have been focusing on connecting people in what I have been talking about so far. But actually, once you create that umbrella, you can connect also all kinds of machines. By machines, I mean sensors, actuators, and with that, you can basically enable many new applications for environment monitoring, for uh, basically uh, sensing all kinds of uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, you want to develop a new, let's say, um, um, uh, uh, a climate model uh, that requires real-time information coming from sensors all over the world. If you have this umbrella that gives you connectivity in real time, uh, not only to connect people, but to, call, to, to connect all these devices, that can help you develop these kind of models. So the bottom line, uh, we are talking about global connectivity of people, these three billion basically remaining people who are unconnected, but also once this is done, to connect also unconnected areas. Areas where maybe sometimes there are no people, but there is interest to discover these areas and to know more about these areas, which means connecting them through uh, IoT device or through uh, uh, sensor and actuators. So let me now try to propose some solution or some of the active research in this area. And as I told you, one of the main challenges is what we call the backhaul challenge. Well, what I described by the fact that we don't want to put fiber optic everywhere and you want to reach this remote area using different means. This is summarized in this uh, uh, very simple, uh, basically, uh, uh, view graphs where we are showing here the quality of experience. You know, the quality of experience can be viewed in terms of data rate, low latency, and so on, as function of the cost per user, in particular focusing on remote, low population density areas. Now, as I told you earlier, optical fiber gives you the best quality, but that's expensive. It doesn't make sense to use optical fiber for low pop population density areas. Classical geosatellite are great for broadcasting, like TV broadcasting. That's the way to go with geosatellites. But they are not designed for two-way internet connectivity. You don't have the right bandwidth, the right quality of service. So what we are after is this upper left corner. We can call it the basically global connectivity holy grail. How can we bring global connectivity everywhere, but in affordable fashion, even for low population density areas? In order to achieve this uh, prophetic, I would say, you know, vision that Tesla had 100 years ago. Tesla, you know, it's not the car. The, this is the, the inventor, the very famous uh, Tesla, because people think now Tesla is only the car, but Tesla is really a person, and maybe uh, you, you heard about him before, uh, here be, 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 being techies. Uh, it's kind of visionary. When you look at his interview uh, that he, ma he made like about more than 100 years ago, he was talking in 5G, 6G terms, and he was talking about really connecting the whole world with a watch and uh, with a very small device. So that's the vision that Tesla had that we are after uh, as part of beyond 5G and 6G. So how can we achieve that? Really, one of the first lessons or message I would like to convey is the following. When you look at 4G, 5G, the Olympic record of 6G, the trend is what? Is to go to smaller and smaller cell. We call that, in our jargon, densify the network. The smaller the cell, the more you can increase the rate, the more you can basically service user by aggressively reusing the spectrum. That's what you use in urban, dense environment. When you move to rural, this is the opposite. Actually, what you want to do is 1G and 2G. You want big cells. You want a single macro station or base station to cover the largest possible area. How can you do that? The simplest way of doing that is, for example, to go to TV towers, Usually they are strategically located on the top of mountains, of hills, with a very good kind of um, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, structures, and you attach to them base stations. 
and you would like to use favorable spectrum, usually the lower part of the spectrum, we call that TV white space spectrum, and with that you can create a macro scale of tens of kilometers. That's the simplest solution you can start with uh, to basically connect some of these uh, regions because you can create easily a 20 kilometer macro stations with this kind of infrastructure. So basically, we did a study. This is a paper with one of my former postdoc, Amar al So the idea here, we took at one of the countries that suffers most from digital divide, Ethiopia. And we look at their base station. This is, by the, by the way, usually public information. If you go to ITU, you know, ITU is an international telecom union based in Geneva, and look at, uh, uh, for example, location of uh, TV stations, you can find it. So we found in this particular area in Ethiopia, we have three TV towers and uh, these are like 3G base stations, and uh, of course there is a big digital divide. What we are showing here in blue and green is density population. So like the, the more blue it is, the highest density population. So you see why they have base station here and here, because they are trying to service the population in the blue and green areas here. Here, basic, they are good locations from a TV tower perspective, but actually there is low population density. What we argued for here is basically if we kind of move, uh, actually what we did is we proposed to first attach base stations to these TV towers and on the top of that we decided to move this TV tower slightly towards this urban environment. With this very simple move, our study showed that you can basically gain roughly 20% in terms of the connected people. Here, by reusing pretty much the same infrastructure, we're not going to space, we're not going to satellite, we're not going to, to do all this complicated stuff. We are still using full terrestrial equipment and just adapting or reusing TV towers to, to basically connect the unconnected. Now, let's assume you don't have a TV tower structure or your terrain is very flat. Uh, the next technology that uh, basically is being investigated, and by the way, I don't have a preference. I was talking to Paolo before this talk. As academics, we usually look in a very neutral way at all the solutions. We try to study them, what are the pros, what are the cons. So I'm not saying this is the best solution. I'm saying this is another solution being proposed. Currently in the US and a few uh, African countries, these are called uh, balloons, airship, aerostats. So they are blimps, if you will. You know, like you see them sometimes if you, uh, if you have, the, uh, I'm not sure in Europe, but in the US, for example, if you go to the Super Bowl, you see this big blimp, usually with a, a publicity uh, on top of it. Same kind of structure. Uh, it can, uh, the altitude can go to 500 meter, one kilometer, and it's tethered. Why do you have a tether? Uh, the tether is there to basically control the blimp uh, and also to provide power. And actually, you can even insert a fiber optic to provide connectivity. And then you go and plug a base station. And with that, you can have basically uh, a 20, 30 kilometer radius coverage with a standard phone. So, you know, you don't have to buy a new phone. The same phone that you are using in the city, you go to this rural Massachusetts and basically connect to the base station in this uh, 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 basically tethered balloon. Uh, what can I do to get more coverage? I need to go higher. So what's the next layer? Is a stratosphere. So what is a stratosphere? So we live in the, on Earth, right? So the first thing we hit is a troposphere. A regular airplane, for example, they fly at 10 kilometer altitude. You go higher, you reach roughly the 20 kilometer altitude. That's what we call the stratosphere. It's a nice sweet spot, uh, basically, uh, in terms of uh, wind speed, there is a little bit of uh, a local minimum. And uh, that's an area that has been identified as an other interesting area to launch flying platforms. They are known as high altitude platform station, in short, HAPS. Some people call them also high altitude pseudo satellite and still HAPS. So satellite, what does it mean? That means they are actually fixed, because often when you talk about satellite, you, you refer to a geosatellite, right? So the beauty of this flying platform at 20 kilometer altitude, actually they move a little bit, usually, uh, especially if they are a glider, and I will talk more about this different kind of hubs. Uh, they move a little bit, but they are pretty much over the same region. 20 kilometer altitude, and basically uh, you can provide connectivity. Actually, the first time I heard about HAPS, 
is uh, maybe 2017, 18. At that time, Facebook, it used to be called Facebook, now it's called Meta, uh, launched the so-called Aquila project. That was one of the first hubs uh, devoted for, connect for connectivity. And then at roughly the same time, Google was working on Loon. These two projects failed. And you may argue, okay, if they fail, that means this technology is bad. I'll tell you, no, I think there is still some hopes. But we can talk more offline or during the Q&A session about this particular experiments. But basically, there is an opportunity to use the stratosphere to connect the world. So let me spend a little bit of time on that, because that's an area where uh, basically, uh, but, you know, by the way, we kind of... Uh, established UNESCO chair on focusing on connected and connected and one of the research direction we are focusing on is hubs. Uh, again, not because I, I particularly love hubs, because I feel it's an interesting solution to be investigated. So these hubs are again flying platforms. They come in three shapes. There is the balloons, like the Loon project. There are the airship or blimps. There is, for example, a famous company, Thales, French company. They have a project called Stratobus. If you Google Stratobus, this is their product. is a, is a, is a big airship at 20 kilometer altitude. And there is a fixed wings, drones, gliders, if you will, or even aircraft. These are basically a Boeing 737 type of size, much lighter, sometime fully covered by solar, basically, uh, photovoltaic cells because many of these drones actually are uh, uh, solar powered. So these are the three shapes uh, that uh, have been kind of uh, researched as potential good uh, HAPS platforms. Now, uh, you know, you can compare them, uh, uh, you know, like from an endurance perspective, the balloons uh, and the airship are best, but uh, uh, and the cost, is, they, they tend to be better from a cost perspective. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are li sometimes leakages. You know, remember the balloons and airships, they rely on the buoyancy principle. So you fill them with basically air, sorry, by gas that is lighter than air, for example, helium. And that's what makes them float or uh, stay aloft, if you will. Uh, so, uh, 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 but uh, the main problem, I think, uh, uh, at the high level from... Um, of these two technologies is the steering aspect, the control. Uh, sometimes you rely on uh, the wind patterns uh, to predict where they will be, and that's why you need to kind of have uh, many of them so that basically you can cover all areas of interest. Whereas when you have a, a glider or an aircraft, this is like an airplane. You can basically uh, command that airplane to go where exactly you want to be. You don't rely on wind movements and so on to kind of uh, uh, basically uh, cover area ba statistically based on uh, uh, many of these uh, balloons. Uh, now, one uh, important aspect, because maybe some of you are curious about that and uh, you know about satellite, where does HAPS technology fit between what we know? So what do we know? We often know our classical urban uh, uh, cellular technology based on mast. This will give you a coverage radius from 10 meter to 10 kilometer if you use TV tower, let's say. Then, of course, you have now the uh, basically Starlink of the world, OneWeb, Kuiper coming with Amazon. These are the Leo satellite constellations. This gives you more coverage, but more coverage, but not really, at least for now direct to the end user. The beauty of a HAPS is in between. It's a coverage between the mast that we use or tower for urban and satellite, but what is very important with the HAPS, you are still using your standard phone. When you buy, at least for now, a Starlink connection, you need to put a dish. You create a local Wi-Fi network and you connect to the satellite through this dish. With the HAPS, and uh, we did an experiment, uh, so that's another actually more high resolution type of, uh, let's say, description of different technologies, starting from a urban tower, let's say, to a low altitude drones that give you slightly more coverage, a tether balloon, which I talked about earlier, a HAPS, all the way to satellite. 
the higher you go, the more the coverage. But at some point, satellite can give indeed a very large coverage, but at some point, a phone will not be good enough from a budgeting perspective to talk directly to the satellite. You will have to go through a relay, which is going to be a satellite dish. The HAPS is exactly in between. This is where basically you still can use a phone to connect to an aerial base station. So an experiment was done last year, uh, actually not very far from our campus. This was done by uh, one of these uh, startup uh, in Cambridge, UK, that builds these uh, apps. It's called Stratospheric Platform. In collaboration with Dodge Telecom, uh, as Kaust, my university, we were involved in uh, uh, designing some of the experiments in collaboration with the Saudi uh, uh, CST, which, which is a commission of uh, space and telecom. So an, an experiment was done to try to basically uh, do a 5G connection from, uh, from a, a, a to a HAPS. And it was uh, quite successful. Uh, we wrote a paper on that. Uh, it, it, it was published last month. Uh, it's in the Open Journal of Communication Science, so it's open access. Uh, you can read this paper and you, you can see how the experiment was designed and the kind of uh, uh, results we were able to obtain. And one of the beautiful results is that with this, uh, this HAPS was actually not really in the stratosphere. It was kind of a, a main aircraft uh, at flying at roughly 14 kilometers. Uh, the radius of coverage was designed to be around seven kilometers only because, you know, again, it was not fully optimized, just as a proof of concept. And we were able to connect uh, people off the road, people in the desert, people even in the, in the boat. As you see here, for example, this is a throughput as function of the distance from the center of the cell. You see in blue, the terrestrial network at some point start failing. You know, you don't have coverage anymore and it's decreasing data rate as you move away from the center of the town. Whereas with the hubs, you have a uniform good coverage, even if you are in the sea very far from basically where the hubs is because the hubs has a much wider coverage. So this was uh, one of the first actually 5G experiment done. It was a year and a half ago, but meanwhile, the same company, Stratospheric Platform, few others have done very interesting uh, other experiments. And uh, by the way, these slides, uh, and as you will see, I will skip some of these slides. The whole idea, I have a lot of backup slides, and I will leave them with Paolo and Claudio. Feel free to, to access them if you want to read more about these and access the reference. This is kind of a summary of what we're able to achieve as part of this experiment, achieve the validation of the technology and how it's good to, for digital inclusion, for being able to bring some new technology help with transportation system, I'll talk a little bit about that, and actually how to help also with maritime communications. So some of the research, now that, you know, at least uh, I, I am one of the believers that HAPS has a room to contribute to this solution, we looked at a variety of problems. One of the problems we looked at with one of my students, Lou and uh, Dr. Bill Mackey, who's a postdoc in my group, is essentially how HAPS can interact with satellite uh, uh, constellation. Why you need this interaction is not required, but it's useful. Because at the end of the day, a HAPS can be used as an access base station. So all of us will have phones, we'll talk to the HAPS. But then the HAPS has to connect the, to the rest of the network. It has to be backhauled itself, either through a ground gateway type of connection or through a satellite constellation. And uh, in this study, actually, our question was, and again, most of our work is stochastic geometry based, was to ask ourselves, is it more useful to densify the network from a HAPS perspective or from a satellite perspective? And actually, our conclusion is, first of all, if you don't have any HAPS, you just rely on uh, satellite. Again, direct satellite to user, at least with nowadays technology, gives you very bad coverage. It's zero, basically. It's a flat yellow curve. You start inserting hubs in green here, 10 hubs, you get a jump. You uh, insert more hubs, 40, you get an, e an extra jump in cover probability. And actually, what this graph are showing is the big jump, you get it by adding more hubs for a fixed number of satellites. So in other words, if you have to make a choice, it's better to densify your aerial network and not your space network. This will give you more access and more coverage probability, at least based on this study. Another interesting study we did uh, is basically how HAPS can help mission. You have a swarm of drones trying to achieve a mission. Uh, the drones are operating at very low altitude, 
and uh, when they talk to each other, they may be obstructed, they are going through vegetation or through other obstacles in urban environment. So basically, if they have to talk to each other, there is a risk that this communication is obstructed because there is a tree in between, a hill in between, a building in between. So if you help the swarm of drones with the haps, you have a big gain in also total latency. Because if you have obstruction, you have to keep trying until you remove the obstruction, whereas as soon as you detect obstruction, you can go through a HAPS relay and uh, basically you, you, you can achieve your low latency by going through this HAPS relay connection. One uh, last uh, simulation that was done uh, as part of our uh, HAPS study was to develop what we call an integrated access backhaul HAPS based solution. In other words, the objective of the study was to try to develop a stratospheric cellular infrastructure. The same, we have a ground cellular infrastructure, why not having a cellular infrastructure in the sky, assuming that you don't want to have any ground infrastructure. This is possible, assuming that you have what you call, uh, and those of you who are, uh, who are familiar with this technology, uh, this terminology, integrate access backhaul, which means here, uh, every single point here is assumed to be a HAPS. And we have what we call a three-layer HAPS. So basically, this is the center of the connectivity. So basically, that's, let's say, downtown area. You can have a 16.4 gigabit per second backhaul access here if you are very close to the downtown. The far away you go, you, the more far away you go, you have a first layer of HAPS, second layer, third layer, because you don't have any other ground infrastructure, all the network is going through these aerial connections. Of course, if you are at the fringe of the cell, you still have connectivity, but the kind of connectivity you have is only 0.5 gigabit per second. Because you, have, you are going through multi-hops, and every time you go through a hop, there are users are using this, uh, basically, uh, uh, resources. So you have very high capacity downtown, and as you move away, you still have capacity, you still have connectivity, it's better than nothing, but of course it goes down, and that's kind of what we're trying to illustrate by this multi-layer integrated access backhaul infrastructure. Now, one last study we did, and I would not uh, 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 spend a lot of time on this, uh, it's a paper uh, uh, with my former student, uh, Sidra Javed, uh, who's now a uh, postdoc in UK. So we looked at this paper where basically we looked at solar-powered drones, so solar-powered hubs. Why uh, uh, these kind of hubs, by the way, w uh, because I, maybe I, I forgot to mention that, there are a uh, few competing approach to power hubs. So I talked about the first one, which is solar. You take a balloon, you take a, a glide. I mean, the balloon and blimp, they benefit from the basically, of course, the buoyancy principle and the, uh, the aerostatic lift. But let's take, for example, a glider or an aircraft. You cover that Boeing 77 size aircraft with solar panels or solar photovoltaic cells, and that uh, allow this structure to be powered. Now, I will talk about the alternative approach later on. What is a little bit the issues that comes with that? Uh, and that was studied in this paper. First of all, the sun flux change, of course, depending on the day and night. I mean, of course, there is no sun in the night. So usually what happens for these solar power hubs, they go up in the day at 27 kilometer, and during the night, to save potential energy, they go down. So that's kind of a cycle they have to go through the whole day to save energy. In the day, they collect solar power. They store it for night operation. Often they have more power, of course, in the day. So what can be part of the design of such kind of uh, network, you can schedule so more intense connectivity during the day and basically maintain minimal connectivity during the night because you'll be relying on your battery during the night and you'll be operating at a basically a lower altitude, so you'll have probably a smaller coverage footprint. So solar powered is an interesting uh, drone because you, it's an interesting problem to study because you have to design a network based on the level of energy available during different times of the day. And it has also some limitation, and the limitations are due to the fact that, as you can imagine, all the region in the world don't have the same level of sun 
uh, exposure, uh, uh, bec the closer you are to the equators, the more sun you have. So basically, there is a favorable region, perhaps, that are solar powered, which are basically around the equator. Not very close. I mean, like Saudi Arabia, for example, is, is relatively far from the equator, but still OK. But if, the, more you, like you, uh, the more you go towards Europe and northern Europe, the less is favorable to use solar power uh, hubs. So what is the alternative approach? The alternative approach is hydrogen fuel cell or hydrogen combustion engine. So there are companies who are developing hubs where basically and hydrogen is okay, in clean energy. Again, uh, all of these are trying to be renewable-based uh, energy sources. Uh, so basically, uh, for stratospheric platform, for example, the startup in UK, use hydrogen combustion uh, uh, engine. Uh, so it's an aircraft. Uh, maybe it takes uh, the, the endurance is less. So again, this aircraft, the idea or hubs, is not to go in the morning and come back in the afternoon. They are supposed to be staying there for weeks, if not for months. So you are look at, looking at long endurance kind of flying, but they come back. And that's one of actually, the, if you will, will go to the Q&A session, that's maybe one of the questions you may ask. The main difference between hubs and satellites, they come back. What does it mean they come back? It means you can maintain them, you can change the base station, you can upgrade it. Whereas a hub, whereas a satellite, you launch it, it's gone. Maybe you can do some software updates, but you cannot change the hardware. Whereas with the hubs, it's an aircraft. It comes back to you for maintenance and for updates and for upgrades. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, you can have some of the results here, d depends on the location and the uh, equator, day-night operation, so on. This is something I, I, I will leave it uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for your own uh, reading. I would like to conclude this section and move to the other technology I would like to highlight, that again, I'm not advocating for HAPS as the only solution. What I'm advocating for is more what we call now in our jargon integrated space by space we mean satellites air hubs and drones and ground networks these three layers are supposed as part of beyond 5g and 6g to operate dynamically and to help the end user connect wherever they are with the same phone and that's the key word i would like to emphasize here what happens before we had phones that work with, sa with satellites, and we had phones that work in urban area for 4G or 5G. The vision is that the end user should not worry about what satellite he or she is connecting to. The network is supposed intelligently to configure itself and connect you to the right base station. If you are in downtown, it will connect you maybe to the Wi-Fi access point within this university. You are in rural areas, maybe a hubs will take care of you. You are deep rural or you are maritime in the middle of the seas, you will have to rely on satellite to get your connectivity. But again, with the same end user device, with the same laptop or phone. That's the vision of beyond 5G and 6G. And with that, you can use what we call the economy of scales, because one of the problems behind the digital divide is the phone used for satellite are very expensive because we don't have many of them. But if the same phone is being used everywhere, then that phone can become, it does have to be an iPhone 14 or 15, but it can be a good enough phone to give you a good uh, high-speed connectivity. So one last comment. These networks are going to be useful also in the context of future transportation systems. Future transportation systems are likely to use also the near space or the near air layer. We are talking about drones being used for delivering merchandise. We are to talking about drones being used for uh, basically flying taxi or flying cars. These often autonomous type of flying vehicles need connectivity. They need connectivity for control and command, especially if they are autonomous. And if they are taking people or they are, we are trying to track all kind of merchandise within these uh, basically flying uh, vehicles, uh, you need uh, connectivity. And uh, many of the studies are showing that if you want to minimize the rate of handover, the best connectivity is going to come either from satellite 
or from hubs because they will create this umbrella that will allow all this layer of flying devices to connect through this uh, higher altitude uh, base station. So let me conclude on that and uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, also the world, uh, or the maritime world, but uh, here we are talking about uh, emerging technologies. Another important technology that uh, we are working on and uh, I like to publicize usually because not everyone is familiar with this technology is, uh, and the title here is Light in Digital Darkness and you'll see why I'm using that. Because I am advocating also for the use, not only me, many of us in this community, use the optical part of the spectrum. When we talk about communication in general, often, you know, automatically we lock on, I mean, wireless communication on RF technologies. We tend to forget, and that, uh, you know, RF is being congested, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very valuable resource, it's kind of controlled by the governments with license and so on, that uh, what we tend to forget is there is quite a bit of available optical bandwidth out there. So if we can use it, we can solve also this spectrum crunch problem and actually uh, in a nice way. So one of the technology that, uh, because optical wireless communication is a wide field by itself, but one nice technology that is actually, I would say relevant to uh, connected and connected type of problem is known as free space optics. To simplify, how many of you have heard about free space optics? Okay, Cup, only couple. So, in simple uh, words, what free space optics is, is like a fiber optic. So fiber optic is what? Is essentially a medium where a laser is being used as a source and the full detector is used as a receiver and you are using basically an optical wave to convey information with optical fiber. Now, remove the optical fi fiber and take the laser and let the laser shoot in the air. That's free space optics. But of course, uh, in, in some particular frequencies where you have minimal attenuation. So it's not a new technology, by the way. It has been there for many years. It has some challenges. Some of the key challenges, it's kind of sensitivity to weather condition, fog, haze, atmospheric turbulence. That's one aspect. And the other aspect is alignment aspect. It gives you super high speed, gigabit, even terabit per second. But the problem, it requires perfect alignment. As soon as you are losing alignment, you lose completely, basically, your connectivity. Now, this technology is nice in the context of hubs and satellite. Let me show you the paradigm we are working on and uh, many of us are working on. So you have what we call VHT. VHT stands for very high throughput satellites, or it can be a HAPS, by the way, it doesn't matter. So this very high throughput satellite or very high throughput HAPS have two sides. One side is using this basically uh, beam hopping technology to go and send beam in a dynamic fashion where traffic is needed. So I can cover this village, during the day, during the night, I don't need that much coverage. I can cover the sea for some boats going by. So basically, it's dynamic uh, beam hopping that allow you to control uh, uh, and, and respond to traffic needs on demand. Now, every beam can have multi-gigabit per second. The satellite or the HAPS acting as a relay has to backhaul all these kind of data streams to the ground to connect the internet. This connection is known as a feeder link or a backhaul link. Currently, this is happening in the RFKA band, which, by the way, is being saturated. Part of it, we want to allocate it for the user link, which are using KU band. Part of it is being kind of uh, in competition with cellular technology because cell, the cell market, cellular, uh, basically, uh, uh, spectrum is after many of these bands. So here, the idea, is to replace all these RF, basically, feeder link connection by a super high speed, free space optic, optical feeder links over hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers. So we are sending few gigabit per second with the laser link from the ground to the space. And the space can be the air, a HAPS, or even further, a satellite. And with that, of course, you have to deal with the weather atmospheric type of challenges and the pointing challenges. And they are being addressed. So some of our work in this area 
is to fully characterize the effect of atmospheric turbulence on the connectivity of ground to air. We focus on HAPS. Uh, and we looked at solutions to mitigate the effects of atmospheric turbulence. One of the nice solutions that's being proposed is adaptive optics. Adaptive optics, in a nutshell, what it is, is an array of deformed mirror that you can move very quickly to undo what atmospheric turbulence induces. It's like, for those of you from electric engineering signal system background, you can think of the atmosphere as a transfer function. What adaptive optics will give you is an inverse transfer function of the end-to-end -end is kind of identity or basically a clean signal. So in one of our recent study with the collaborators, that's an illustration in the lab of one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Boon Oi, showing how basically you start with a pure beam. Uh, after turbulence, you get distorted beam. You apply that optic post compensation, you get a cleaned beam. Uh, Sometimes, uh, if you have some constraint on the size or the weight at the receiver end, you can do it in a pre compensation fashion. So you pre distort the beam, uh, assuming that you know roughly the kind of turbulence you will see. So that essentially, when you go through this turbulence, you end up having a nearly pure beam. So, to make a long story short, what we were able to do is to analyze performance. We were able to get some closed form expression in this paper with Yalshin on the uh, ouch probability. Yeah, they are complicated expression, but they are, uh, they are, they are useful to, to characterize the channel. We did them for different kind of channels. But let, let me focus more on this. So basically here what you have, and I will conclude with that, just to tell you uh, how this kind of link operate. So here we are comparing three kind of links. We are comparing an uplink in blue, a downlink in red. So an uplink is ground to hubs. A downlink is a hubs to ground. A horizontal link is hubs to hubs because as I told you sometime you want to create this anti-gate access backhole so you want to connect hubs among themselves. What this study is showing that basically, first of all, when you use adaptive optics, you get always a better performance. Be we, why? Because the arch probability is lower for a fixed altitude. That's what you want to see. You want to see a lower arch probability. And then another interesting thing is the downlink is performing better than the uplink. And the reason is simple. When you look, and uh, I mean, probably we don't know that, and, and even myself, I didn't know that before uh, I got to the study, the profile of atmospheric turbulence tend to be very strong, close to ground. And as you go up, atmospheric turbulence decrease. By the time you reach 20 kilometers, it, it's, it, it's, it's over. There is no atmospheric turbulence anymore. You are beyond the weather. So what's happening? When you have an uplink, you send the link, and right away you are hit by strong turbulence, so you start having this beam wandering, beam spreading, all kind of bad effects. And this cumulatively, by the time you reach 20 kilometers, degrade quite a bit the performance of your link. And that's why the uplink is the worst. Downlink, you start in a benign way. Only towards the end, you start being distorted. And that's why, in a way, it's not reciprocal process. Now, but the main lesson to, le to read from this is horizontal link. If you have HAPs operating at 20 kilometers, actually the best way to connect them is through free space optics because there is no atmospheric turbulence to deal with. The only problem you have to solve is a pointing problem. And uh, if you look beyond HAPs, the next generation of Starlink, the next generation of OneWeb, Kuiper, which is the Amazon pre promised mega constellation, are all going to use free space optic to create inter-satellite connection. Because you cannot beat optics if you want to have high speed at super high energy efficiency and with a small size. That's, that's physics. So basically, uh, uh, that, 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 that's clear, uh, a great market for FSO for all aerial type of connection or space type of connections. Now, I have three more minutes to go. One of the last study we showed is how we can combine HAPS, satellite, and FSO. And the idea here is very simple, is to use HAPS as relay. So I told you HAPS can be great uh, access base station for rural areas that create this 50, 60 kilometer radius, 100 kilometer actually, can be up radius of coverage. But HAPS can be nicely used as relay of free space optic links. So let's assume you are trying to connect this ground station to the satellite, especially the uplink. I told you we have major problems in the uplink. So the idea here is to use this HAPS to clean up the signal, regenerate it, and retransmit to satellite in the uplink. We did a detailed study with the 
uh, former student and so on. And what we showed indeed that actually a relay type of connection will always outperform a direct connection. And more importantly, that the optimal location of the hubs is when you put it exactly on the top of the ground station. So as you see here, the arch probability as function of the threshold of outage. So the blue, which is the highest arch probability, is a direct link. No relaying. As soon as you start using relaying, basically you start improving. Red, green, and so on. Now what is the difference between these different colors is essentially the location of the hubs. So you may think, I need to put the hubs here at midway. Actually, that's not good. Why? Because you are increasing the distance over which you are going through a turbulent environment. What you want is to take this solution, the solution where the angle of inclination is zero, which means the hubs is exactly on the top of the ground station, to minimize the distance the FSO link has to go through atmospheric turbulence. And that gives you the minimum arch probability. So with that, I am just on time here. Uh, what I want to do is uh, the world of 6G is very active. There's a lot of research going on. If you go to the ICC and Globcom type of conference, you'll see all kind of research on 6G. What some of us are focusing on is one important aspect of beyond 5G and 6G related to the digital divide. We want to connect more people. And this actually has some interesting research implications, in particular, in terms of integrating aerial and space network to be able to provide this global coverage uh, type of solution. And also, free space optic technology, which again, is not a new technology. It's a technology that has been there for many decades, if not, uh, I mean, for many years, if not many decades. But it struggled to emerge or compete in the terrestrial market because of the sensitivity to basically uh, weather condition, atmospheric turbulence, and because of the strong performance of RF technologies. But there is a room for FSO to strive and to compete very well for this new type of non-terrestrial network, aerial and space network. So with that, I would like to thank you. And uh, I would uh, if you want to learn more about some of our research, you can go to the, our website. And uh, we are all here trying to, again, go towards this interesting vision that Tesla had uh, more than 100 years ago, trying to connect uh, everyone, and when I say everyone, every person, but also all kind of machines globally. Thank you again for the invitation, and thank you for your attention. Okay, all right. Thanks, Lynn, for the talk. Yes. We were flooded by questions. Sure. Uh, thanks, Lido, for being here. Um, <laughs> okay, you need to know that last week we had uh, Richard Stallman here, and uh, the audience is still um, thinking about that. So the first question is, do you think your proposals are applicable in a world increasingly dominated by profit? Companies reluctant to invest on infrastructure that is often redundant. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, and just put it on your... Okay. Uh, yes, it's hard. I agree, and that's, that was uh, the problem where we, we faced for the last 40, 50 years. Uh, and that's normal. I mean, uh, part of sustainability is to have basically a solution that makes sense from a business perspective. So if you have a solution that is great technically, but uh, doesn't bring money, uh, you know, the government can subsidize for the first year, second year, third year, but eventually, uh, you know, this extra money will not come. So you need to come up with solutions that are sustainable. So in my view, some of the solutions we are proposing can be sustainable with an initial push, which means you subsidize for the first or second year, and then hopefully it picks up. So let me again, not because I'm a strong advocate for HAPS, but uh, explain why HAPS can be a uh, a good proposition, a proposition that can make money and can also help connect people. And uh, we'll give a concrete example. 2017, Facebook launched the first hubs to bring global connectivity. It was called the Aquila project. Probably you heard about it. It failed. The same time, Loon launched these balloons. Actually, they were operational in Peru 
with mobile network operator connecting people in the you know uh, mountains of Peru and uh, at some point it didn't make business sense and they closed but why did they close in my view and that's again speculative or kind of trying to understand the hubs was used only as a platform to bring connectivity and were designed by company we all agree that the great companies but these are software companies companies are good at other kind of level of expertise what we are seeing now is more i would say company that are expert in building aircraft we talk about boeing airbus Thales. that's their bread and butter they know how to build aircraft and what they are building they are not building base station in the sky they are building powered towers in the sky which means they will give you a 20 kilometer height tower with power and with a certain size for the payload and a certain weight for the payload and then you can enable an ecosystem of application communication is one application among many you can use a payload to put a camera and use for border control to put sensor and monitor methane gas leaks put radar and have better weather condition put a camera for smart agriculture and imaging applications you can do a lot of application that satellite do in a much better way let's take imaging application you have CubeSat there are a lot of companies that are making a lot of money based on pure imaging no connectivity but if you have one CubeSat and you want an image you will not get a real-time image you have an image every 12 hours maybe or every six hours with the hubs I can have a continuous image the whole day with a much better resolution because I'm at a higher altitude so what I'm trying to say the solution that can succeed are solution where things can average out where you can have uh, maybe uh, more profitable type of markets helping markets that are subsidized with eventually maybe globally you can still make quite a bit of money okay and that's why I believe there is a room sometime to combine profit with uh, with basically uh, 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 you know uh, 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 let's say bringing good to people Stop. and bringing uh, uh, prosperity and so on well this is about uh, uh, profit but there are also questions about uh, performance so 5g promised uh, fast speeds and extremely low, low latency for mobile devices everywhere but in most places it was more like a 4g rebrand uh, how can 6g performance uh, be guaranteed yeah i think uh, people and, and i don't know if paolo and claudio at least uh, I, I know that in this area. Um, many believe that uh, 5g is not a great success you know there is this theory behind the fact that the odd g's are not very successful and the even g's are usually the success which means we project a lot of good things and we don't deliver actually we cannot deliver in 10 years we deliver in 20 years so 4g was success 2g was success 3g and 5g so 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 maybe 6g will deliver what 6g promised uh, 6g will deliver what 5g promised okay but nonetheless beyond that what i am trying to say actually uh, we are already doing quite well in terms of speed and in many areas We're lacking is some of the issues I emphasize where basically there is some area where there is no connectivity whatsoever so there are efforts that have to be done in 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 kind of bringing connectivity from zero to at least something that is acceptable but in terms of performance although maybe it's not great but still accessible in many areas but maybe not up to the expectation and maybe 6g will perfect what 5g failed to to to, to deliver let's say still on the performance and the implementation cost what are the implementation costs compared to the current terrestrial solutions? Which solution has the best trade-off? And thank you for your time. You mean like uh, in terms of uh, future network or current? Of network? hubs. Yeah. Oh, hubs. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, there is no, we like hubs, as I told you, the way I see it now is not a, a base station in the sky, is more a, a, a tower in the sky. And the key point, how to make this tower powered in the sky the cheapest possible. Is it going to go through solar type of uh, power or hydrogen fuel cell? Is it going to be a glider or a basically a blimp? I don't think uh, the answer is there yet. 
uh, all of these startup technologies are competing. I hope maybe they will complement each other for the variety of application. But I think the answer of what will be uh, the answer of uh, the winning technology will be coming soon, especially if hubs will emerge as a successful market. When it comes to 6G, we're talking about uh, satellites and hubs being connected everywhere. Have you? 6G researchers ever thought about a P2P distributed antennas leverage on personal devices? Yeah, I mean, uh, like device-to-device -device communication, multi-hub communication is, is, is there. I mean, it has its limits, I mean, at, at any level. Uh, you, you know, clearly beyond the two, three hubs, often things, you know, don't, don't work. Uh, but uh, the concept of peer-to-peer, D2D, at the user level, at the hubs level, at the satellite level through inter-satellite links is there and, and will be also used. But at the user level, it wouldn't help? It, it, it can help, but again, uh, I think it has limitation on how much hops you can do or how many, like the, that, that, how much it scale up. But at, at a limited range, yeah, why not? We got en environmental questions. Uh, would hubs turn into debris and polluted stratosphere as satellites are doing with the space around Earth? What would be a way to clean the debris? No, actually, this is a, a question where we can answer very easily. If there is a problem, indeed, there is probably a space debris problem because you launch a satellite and it's there and forever. Perhaps, as I told you, it comes back. There is no debris. That's actually the beauty of it. It's an aircraft. You are sending it if solar power, so there is no uh, uh, CO2 kind of emission or even hydrogen fuel cell. So in the contrast, it's, there is no debris whatsoever. And are you also tapping into existing satellites as well? Like you mean for HAPS or uh, in general? F for apps as well. No. For, I mean, the HAPS can use satellite uh, as part of their backhaul. You are creating a mesh in the air. So HAPS and satellite can interact and can complement each other for many applications. But they may also work uh, solo on their own and create their own, uh, like I showed here, infrastructure in the air. So they may not need satellite, like they may need them for certain applications. So they're sustainable. They come back. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, what about traffic with hubs? Uh, how many would you need to have a proper coverage? So, you know, many of these companies, when you look at their business plans, they kind of uh, always uh, uh, advocate for the fact that a hubs can replace 400 tower in the ground. I mean, for a standard type of uh, cover of an uh, urban tower. So there is a big, of course, saving, uh, and the more importantly, you are using a single device uh, to kind of cover these large areas. So definitely, uh, of course, uh, you have much higher coverage, but it's much more expensive to build a tower at 20 kilometers than having a mast at uh, you know, a few tens of meters in the ground. There, you, we'll be talking a lot about um, sustainability, and uh, one of the, the questions that people have is uh, if 6G, um, or a new and better technology comes out, how do we make sure it's used to help poor countries instead of improving our infrastructure? I mean, I would say if the technology is perfected and basically becomes, to a certain extent, affordable, it's going to be easier for all countries to acquire this technology. And let me give two arguments. Now, let's assume you don't have... I'm not talking about the US, China, I mean, this big superpower or European Union, you know, the people have the money and the means to, to establish mega constellations. If you are a small country, and essentially you don't need to make a constellation because you don't need to cover the whole globe. And when you have a mega constellation, most of the time, these satellites are not covering you, they are somewhere else. Uh, the beauty of a hubs, again, if it's made affordable, maybe with a couple of hubs, when I say couple, maybe eight, 10, you can cover most of your territory. Okay, and it's under your full control because we talk also about uh, so-called uh, uh, data, gov uh, data sovereignty. When you go through a mega constellation, you, you know, your data is leaking. It's going through a Starlink connection or uh, you know, any other kind of uh, mega constellation. If it's your own hubs with a gateway in your own country, it's your data and you fully control it. So I think if hubs are successful, actually, it is definitely much more affordable then uh, uh, getting into uh, 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 launching your own mega constellation. Got it, thank you. 
we got two similar questions still about on the profit side, let's say. So companies focus on profit mostly and uh, return of investment. Wouldn't the network meant to connect the world be a better out of the logic of profit and managed by and controlled by the states, by the countries themselves? Uh, so it's been subsidized. And this is happening. I mean, this is what, I mean, what actually, uh, I mean, uh, which is one of the good things, uh, uh, not that there are a lot of bad things out of COVID, but one of the good things uh, after COVID, if you look at some of the statistics, there was some improvement because many of the government realized that connectivity is not anymore a luxury, in a way it's becoming a requirement. So definitely the state can help uh, through subsidies, through kind of investment in this uh, equipment, but again, usually, you want to see, and the U.S., I don't know if you know, for example, there has been a big major uh, project over the last infrastructure uh, uh, project over the last couple of years to connect more, a lot of these rural areas. But uh, like we, we all said, by experience, you don't want, often these projects are, cannot be sustainable if you just keep relying on the state or government subsidies because these can disappear in difficult time in budget reduction type of cuts. So what is usually good you want to have initial subsidies, and this technology should pick up and should become sustainable and profitable. But you may need the first push. The first push, yeah, sure. Still on the negative sides, let's say. Um, we always focus on the positive effects of globally connected world. What would be the negative sides? Are they taken in consideration by research and investors? I mean, you mean the, ne the negative side of, uh, yeah, I, I one time... Of hyper-connection. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I gave a talk somewhere and someone, uh, like, in a, in, a, in, a, in a nice way, he told me we, we should not connect the unconnected, we should unconnect the connected. Uh, because we are, th like those of us who are connected are spending too much time on our phones, on our computers. So, of course, I mean, especially the kids, the new generation of, uh, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, 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 you know, young uh, generations. Yeah. generations um, nothing against you, but uh, because we have a lot of students here and the uh, young generation. Uh, I mean, there is a so-called addiction problem to social media, to connectivity. Uh, this, of course, uh, has its own problems. But, uh, but of course, I think uh, the benefits are important from an economic pers prosperity perspective. Uh, so, but uh, definitely, there are some maybe bad effects that ca can happen, like we are facing in, in urban, well-connected environments. Okay, got it. There's tens more questions, and I think we will leave many of them for the networking part. I would like to uh, close with a few a few ones. So, last week we had the Richard Stallman. People are asking, what happens if these new phone cells, new phone cells, become a surveillance system for citizens combined with well-known SS7? Drones may have camera feed. Yeah, there is this concern, as I told you, privacy and security. Connect, these two things go in parallel. When you are connected, uh, you know, you open the door for being uh, monitored, for being uh, tracked. So this is where I think the government or the state has to kind of uh, use its uh, authority to make sure that no abuse is, uh, happens, that our privacy, our security is preserved. But uh, it's a fact. Connectivity, when, as soon as you start being connected, automatically you are subject to being uh, tracked and being uh, monitored and being uh, your habit being learned and uh, and your data being used etc that's that's another down maybe we talk about downside that's kind of a, a fact that where the government can help try to protect the population against that okay final question do you ever get uh, death threats uh, from conspiracy theorists? Me, myself? Yeah. Not really, but no? uh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, we, with uh, Luca, uh, like uh, my collaborator from uh, Roma Trovargata, he's, uh, uh, I mean, he's a good friend of mine, but he, he, he has strong opinion about EMF. He feels that yeah, we are really operating in a safe regime. And I think he got some time in a heated debate uh, with the people who are against uh, radio communication for, from a health perspective. There are people, especially at the, as I told you, it's a, it's a recurring cycle at the beginning of every new generation. Uh, Sometimes people talk about the fact there is a lobby behind them because they want to, to keep the old uh, infrastructure, they don't want to invest in infrastructure, but often there are strong voice that come at the end of every decade, uh, early decade when the new generation is deployed. Uh, with EMF radiation and there are some friction between people about are we safe, uh, are we kind of creating all kind of new disease, are we 
killing birds uh, because of uh, all this EMF radiation that we are uh, putting on the air. Uh, but not personally, no, I, I have not been very, <laughs> very engaged in this discussion, let's say. Luckily, and uh, keep the good work. Uh, thank you for your time. A round of applause. Okay, there were ten, tens more of questions uh, for Slim, so you can ask them uh, to him directly at the end of the event, uh, right uh, when we're going to have uh, the networking part. Let me change back to my slides, because uh, we are wrapping, wrapping up. All right, here it is. Okay, whoa, nice. Okay, little spoiler. Um, we made a, we are again, partnering with uh, um, PyCon Italia. So the event we're gonna, is going to happen at the end of May. If you plan to go, we're going to send out a form in the next days. We have uh, a couple of tickets uh, for you to attend PyCon worth uh, hundreds of euros in the beautiful Florence. Uh, so just stay tuned on our channels and we will open up for you. Julia, for closing. For closing. If you haven't uh, got it yet, just rush because we uh, have uh, just a few uh, left. We will probably, really probably have another batch, no, but... No, uh, so yet. No, so yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we sold well, over 100 t-shirts. Yeah. Just to tell you. Okay. Well, in, if you're in doubt, just get it because <laughs> there are very few left. And uh, after three events uh, of wearing it, obviously I washed it, but it's uh, uh, amazing. We can confirm it. Adorable, with adorable graphic, and at a very convenient price, let's say. Okay, and since uh, Spec and Tech uh, is turning seven years old these days, uh, uh, as an association, it's going to be again a raccolta fondi, which is going to help us financially as well. For wrapping up, uh, uh, networking part, we're going to have around an hour, 15 minutes uh, before we're going to kick you out of this venue and we wrap the doors. Uh, as always, we're going to have the beautiful focaccia by Focacceria Belvedere and uh, bottles of beer, bottles of soft drinks and taralli pugliesi for everyone. You can contribute to the association by donating a few euros the way you like it or by getting our t-shirts, our swag, etc. And uh, here is where we're going to hold the uh, networking part. Uh, we are going to guide you from upstairs. We leave the room this side. Uh, follow the blue path, go down, and there's going to be the food and the network. Just pay attention, as we said, I mentioned the other times, there, there's going to be uh, an exhibition of... Uh, uh, Virgin saints, Marys. yeah, of saints <laughs> and Virgin Marys, uh, from Tiro. yeah, in, in in the main room. So please don't touch it. Be nice. You did a great job in the yeah. past events. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was. Um, They're gonna perfectly. be there looking you and judging you again. <laughs> Thank you so much. We meet you on the 20th of May to talk about AI ethics. Thanks, uh, ICT Days. Thanks, Dizzy. Good Thank night. Thank you so much. <laughs>